before you podcast to put your headphones on. Headphones on. Put your headphones on. You take your headphones off, you put your headphones <laughs> on. <laughs> All right. So uh, let's just jump right in. Yeah. Are we doing the thing that, or are we doing a, a lead up? Well, we so we don't have much time today. Yeah, no, today's a little pressed. We're a little pressed for time, and um, we didn't have a lot to report. We didn't get a walk in. No. Nope. I think I'm, you know, just plugging along with our lives. Just plugging along with our lives. I feel that yeah. way too. This has Eating been. the food, changing the diaper. <laughs> It's washing been, laundry. Yeah, it's been a busy week. Feeling a little discouraged. Oh, you and I uh, went to a socialist get together. Yeah. Meet up in Adrian. And it was just us. And it was just us. Which was kind of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, we were supposed to meet some of the the DSA here in Valley DSA folks. There. Yeah. Either we went to the wrong place, or they had left already, or or something. something. We, but, we don't really know. But it doesn't. We didn't feel disappointed because we got to hang out in this little um, donut shop in in uh, Adrian. Adrian for a, delightful. for a while, yeah. and it was so peace and peaceful and quiet yeah. that you and I got a chance to chat in a way that we haven't in a long time for months. For months, we were talking about okay, our plans for the house, our plans, plans for what this, what are we going to do with all this all this all this stuff, stuff all this life stuff that's right. happening that. Involves some complicated trade-offs and decision-making, especially regarding the old house. Yeah, yeah. So, so we have a plan now. And you, have, you have some plan. Yeah. I feel, uh, I feel immeasurably better right. having had a chance to talk through all the things that are really making me anxious and what's weighing you know, on you. and weighing yeah. on me. So. Right. So it was actually serendipitous. Yeah, it was. It was. It was nice that it, it would have been good to see everyone, but we still needed to have. <laughs> we, we needed to do that. It was, it was good. And I also kind of renewed my sense to make sure we get a chance to do that frequently. We need to do it more often because yeah. very often Grace and I only get to talk to each other in very short bursts. And I right. mean, when we're in at home, even in the evening, trying to get ready for bed, and every, we rarely, I think, can speak for more than a minute, literally one minute without an interruption. interruption right. Yeah. So, so it's yeah. very hard under those circumstances to get to the things that are really get to the meat weighing of the conversation. Up, bothering us and that <laughs> right. needs some some thought and right. and if we do get into like a a thing a, a thing a right. topic that's maybe upsetting or something we might be not we're not yelling at each other but we might be like you know waving our arms and gesticulating and like right. <laughs> talking emotionally mm-hmm Right, and the kids are like, are you guys going to get a divorce? So what's going on? We're not even fighting. We're not even fighting, guys. We're just like talking about an upsetting topic and mm-hmm. venting, you know, right, and not right. even at each other, just like in venting. Room, like in general. To, you know, to Which witness. Which I think is for, telling. To witness for each other, right? They, they don't actually know what a fighting looks like. They don't know what a, f- a fight looks like, because honestly, if we're really having a fight, we're probably not talking to each other. <laughs> like really not talking. Yeah. So anyway. <laughs> I, I think we've only uh, as what two? I had two fights in our whole. Yeah, I think we've only had two fights really. Two, two like I'd call bad fights, and yeah. occasionally a, a tiff. A tiff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we we are pressed for time, so I think we're just we're going to talk today about one article. One article, and try and, and get through that's it. That's the update we've got. Yeah, try to get through it in a, a relatively. Uh, expeditious way right. although it is a big topic it's a big so. topic it's a long article um uh, yeah. to the new yorker the annals of medicine february 5th 2018 what does it mean to die yeah so why don't you introduce this because i i did just read it but um i was rushing and you've had a little more time to sit with well it. yeah and also and I've, I've been following this story since the beginning yeah okay um, i had not heard of about this this uh this girl and her So in 2013, a uh, young woman uh, named Jahi McMath uh, went in for ta- a tonsillectomy at Children's Hospital in Oakland. And um, uh, she did make it out, so to speak. A tonsillectomy is supposed to be a really common, safe operation for children. They Has do been it, for decades. They right. do it frequently. I had one in the early 70s, right? Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. I remember they gave me ice cream. My throat was sore, sore for a couple of days. I went home, right? Yeah, it, it's, I'm, it's unremarkable. I'm old enough that they probably used ether. Oh, at the time, yes, they right. probably did. Yes, in the you know to anesthetize me, right. right? So, um, uh, something went wrong. What what uh, is not clear? And um, she, her heart stopped postoperatively. She was she recovered from surgery, and was awake and conscious again and eating again. But then, like had a popsicle, uh, yeah. but was coughing up blood for several hours, and then her heart stopped. And it took them two and a half hours to resuscitate. Several hours in, and she was bleeding a lot. A she lot. was filling up a container mm-hmm. like like two hundred milliliters of blood. blood, and someone had a note in her chart that she had this sort of physiological abnormality where her aorta was very very close to her trachea. Maybe they yeah. they likely. I mean, it, the the article doesn't claim it one way or the other because the New Yorker doesn't want to get sued. Right. But somebody nicked her aorta and she was bleeding heavily Definitely. after this surgery. surgery. Um, and then, it, then it, it, uh, at one point her heart stopped. It took them two and a half hours to um, get her breathing Ugh. and get her stabilized. And when they got her stabilized, um, she uh, had suffered some, some significant amount of brain damage. Yeah. And she they, needed to be placed on a ventilator. Right, she needed to be placed on a ventilator. When they removed the breathing tube, she wouldn't start she breathing, breathing on her own. own. Right, and uh, they de- declared her brain dead, and her family was uncomfortable with that diagnosis, and also just kind of bewildered as to how a tonsillectomy, tonsillectomy comes out like this. Yeah, they were they were neglecting her, and I I, I believe that this is just. From what I've read recently and experienced too, went through with mm-hmm. friends and relatives is right. Hospitals just neglect black patients straight horribly. Up. They, just straight up. Yeah, they don't see them as people. It's like, oh, we've got some livestock here. I guess we'll do whatever. They, they don't. They don't show the same level of concern and attention to them, especially postoperatively. Yes, that they do to white patients. That's just that seems to be. Borne out by the statistics. statistics. And that appears to just be the deal. Yeah. And it's horrifying, you uh, know. Yeah. But this is what one of the things we mean when we say racism can kill you. It can actually just kill you. Yeah. Um, so they declared her uh, brain dead. The family um, contested it, so to speak, um, and hired an attorney and pressed the hospital to provide her the care so she could recover. The hospital insisted, no, she's dead. We're not going to provide this care. Yeah. And right. they were kind of at a stalemate. Finally, their agreement they reached is that the hospital would release her to the coroner. The coroner would de- declare her dead, and then they could take her. <laughs> Just think about what that, <laughs> like the contradictions that what that entails. Feels, right, what this means. Which is, I, I get basically the hospital is saying, um, we're not going to do anything differently. Perhaps the only the only concession the hospital's making in that agreement is not to remove the ventilator. Right. That that was about it. That's and, the only concession the hospital. And making. they were saying, you know, um, we want we want a written record that our liability is limited. limited. Exactly. Yeah. That's what the hospital is saying. We want a written record that our liability is limited. Have a nice day. Yeah. They were telling her so. Yeah, you you highlighted a thing. I, I highlighted a lot of things, but okay. I'm not going to try and read them all. But um, yeah, so the social workers were urging the family repeatedly to make plans for taking her off the ventilator and donating her organs. Yeah, and they the family was saying, we we want to know what happened, happened to, to her. her. Before we'll consider anything, anything like about that. that. We will, we'll explain what happened here. They wanted her medical records. What did you and they would allow her to l- allow the family to look at her records, but not take them, you know, away. Oh, right, right. Not right? to have the records, right? Or copy them, which I've run into this. Uh, I've, I've run into the same kind of stonewalling over right. records too. Right, that's a thing. It's a thing, right? right. Um, even when I had a durable medical Global power of attorney. attorney. Yeah. Yeah, I can read the records. Sorry. Right, and the family kept saying, you know, she's warm, she moves, you know, and. How you know? How, why are you calling her, her dead? dead? And the the uh, doctors were saying this is like a spinal reflex. Spinal reflex, and, or, and, and just insisting that you know she's dead, and I don't want to put all, 
engage the illusion that she's not dead. They also were saying, well, bas- basically, she's she's going to start to decay if you just right. leave her on the ventilator, the and then she quote, won't oh, look good for the, the funeral. funeral. Right. She's going to start to actually decompose Yeah, if you just leave her on the ventilator. And yes, and then won't look good for the funeral. As if that's, and I think that's that. That of course, you know, they they treated her family like children. Yes, they were very condescending and very belittling condescending. to them, their to their concerns, insulting. Right, them, and as if they didn't comprehend that the family is literally bewildered as to how this could happen. Right, like right. so, what happened? What went wrong? So that she's now you're describing her as dead now. Yeah. After this. Yeah. Whereas they're like, oh, she's dead now. Let's move on. So, um, say something about the, the cap on liability. Right? Oh, that's an interesting thing. And this was actually, I think, this is the reason they got any traction at all. Yeah. They hired this personal, in- or actually this personal injury lawyer agreed to take the case pro, pro bono. Right. And his first thing, the very first step, he said, listen, the hospital can't unplug her because that limits their liability to $250,000. There's a cap on liability for hospitals in California. Mm-hmm. So if the patient dies, the most the hospital is liable for is $250,000. It's unlimited if the patient is still alive. Yes. Yeah. So the hospital has a vested interest in the in, coroner calling her dead. In, call, in, in declaring her in dead. In declaring her dead. The hospital yeah. has a, a significant vested interest in declaring her dead and in, in unplugging the ventilator. And so this this attorney Christopher Dolan, yes, uh, his sense was uh, the article says uh, is a self described cafeteria Catholic. He acted on a vague feeling that a child with a beating, beating heart, heart is not entirely dead. dead. So you know, yeah, uh, and and really that that's was his first line of defense was to injun- get an injunction. So he got an injunction right. so that the hospital could not just <laughs> just pull the plug, just pull the plug, like you know. The family's not there. They unplug her and they come back and she's dead. And he had to fight for that. Yes. And he had to, you know, repeatedly fight for it. Go back to court and go back to court. Right. Go back to court and get an extension before they made this agreement that, okay, we won't pull off the ventilator, but she's going straight to the corner for a declaration of death. Right. Um, Yeah. Uh, From there, they moved her to a uh, care facility in new jersey uh, in new jersey and i should note new york and new jersey are the only two states in the united states where the family does not have to uh, embrace a declaration of brain death for religious reasons mm-hmm. and those laws exist in Cal- in uh, new york and new jersey because of the orthodox jewish population so they did this this study called uh, radionuclide cerebral blood flow study yeah and according to that study, which was before they released her, before they the released family, her, um, her, they did not see any any brain activity, any blood flow, blood flow right. through, the blood through the brain, through the brain, right? Yeah, they weren't looking for electrical activity. Correct. They were looking for blood, blood flow. cerebral blood flow. So they claimed that basically the uh, that this was a white void, a white out in the part of the head where the brain is. Right. There's no blood going there. So. That was and that was that's the hospital's claim, which I you know, I don't see any grounds to reject that, um, except for their self interest. Their so, medical ethics committee said that uh, no conceivable goal of medicine, preserving life, curing disease, restoring function, or alleviating suffering can be achieved by continuing to ventilate and artificially support a deceased patient. So they insisted on calling her dead. Yes, that was yes. An absolute insistence on her uh, deceased state. Yeah. Um, so the move to New Jersey allowed them to get into a hospital that would provide her, so, you know, would perform a tracheotomy so she could breathe more safely. Yep. Provide her a feeding tube so she could actually get nourishment. Right. So she was, her physical condition was deteriorating, deteriorating. in a manner that was kind of. Sim- was consistent with what the hospital described. Uh, the, yeah. But one of, I mean, she had not received any nutrition for three, three weeks. weeks. And yeah, yeah, that's you're going to look kind of a little... It's going to stress your body out. A little sallow. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to look well after three weeks without any food. Right, right. Um, and uh, so this new hospital... So in New Jersey, they installed a tracheotomy. They performed a tracheotomy yeah. and it installed a feeding tube. And after a significant lapse of time, like a month or so, yeah. she started to look better. 
Right. So she, yeah, she actually started to recover physically. So this these laws mm-hmm. tell us about these these this variation in the law. Oh, that, that's I, I was I was kind of mentioning starting to mention that just a moment yeah, ago. I'm sorry. How um, we're a little disorganized <laughs> in New York and New Jersey. Yeah. Um, the family is not required to just to say okay. The person's dead. Right. We accept that diagnosis. So in other words, it's basically a religious exemption for embracing that definition of brain death. For who? For uh, families of patients who've been declared brain dead. Well, uh, the article says basically it was uh, the laws in both states were written to accommodate Orthodox Jews. Yes. In Th- specific. That's what initiated the existence of the law. Anyone can use yes. the law. Yes. Anyone can use that law in the state of New Jersey. You don't have to be an Orthodox Jew yeah. to use it, but the law is written to accommodate orthodox jews in both states the population is large enough that yeah. it, it's a thing they get representation but the talmudic notion of 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 uh life of being alive that, that you breathe at all is that you breathe right you're right. breathing at all so as long as someone's breathing at all they're considered to be alive even if it's artificial breathing yeah and um it's basically a religious exemption law in those two states right yes <clears throat> so anyone gets to claim that exemption and say, uh, well, she's still breathing. She's not dead. We want her to receive care X, Y, and Z. So they did. And that hospital had her, I think, for three, at least three months, maybe possibly as long as mm-hmm. six. Mm-hmm. But she was in that hospital for many, many months. And in that time, she began to recover physically. So like some of the bloating and deterioration reversed. Yes. Yeah. She began menstruating. Yeah, she's she actually she was thirteen she, when she went in for surgery. Right, she was on the cusp of of her first period. Puberty. Right, yeah, of entering pu- puberty. And so her grandmother's uh, like, "Yo, oh, she started menstruating. You should note that in her record." And they're yeah. like, "Ah, we don't know why that's happening." It, that's not that's not menstruation. She's just bleeding from her vagina and nowhere else for some reason for five days, and then it stops. So, but yeah. There's um, Arthur Kaplan, founding director of NYU Division of Medical Ethics, mm-hmm. quote, you know, mentioned as perhaps the best known bioethicist in the country, wrote that yeah. keeping her on a ventilator amounts to desecration of a body. Uh, he's yeah. saying you can't feed a corpse, she's going to start to decompose. Uh, you know, the Lawrence McCullough, a professor, a professor of medical ethics at Cornell, criticized any hospital that would admit Jahi. What could they be thinking? He said to USA Today. There, uh, USA Today. There's a word for this: crazy. Crazy. Right. Oh, it's child abuse. It's child abuse, right? Um, yeah, yeah. But then they do quote a few people who say who were bioethicists mm-hmm. who say, "Wait a minute, wait a minute. This is out of hand." Yeah, and just they're, like, they're troubled by the tone, especially, right? Right. So Robert Truog, director of the Center for Bioethics at Harvard. Uh, said, I think the bioethics community felt the need to support their traditional understanding of brain death. I would say conventional understanding. But to the on. point, well, he's, it's, he's, I'm just quoting. Yes. <laughs> to okay. the point that they were really treating, yeah, conventional in the modern convention, the modern not convention. really traditional. Not really traditional. Right. To the point that they were really treating the family with disdain. Um, Truog thought that the social context of the family's decision had been ignored. African Americans twice as likely as whites to ask that their lives be prolonged as much as possible, as much as possible even in the case of irreversible coma, a preference that likely stems from fears of neglect. A large body of research has shown that black patients are less likely to get appropriate medications and surgeries than white ones, regardless of their insurance and education, and are more likely to receive undesirable Medical interventions like, like amputations. Amputations, yeah. And he said, uh, "Doctor is saying your loved one is dead, and your loved one doesn't look dead. I understand it might feel that once again you're not getting the right care because of the color of your skin." Right. Right. I believe that she was basically being treated by as a welfare queen. Right. Yes. You know that this girl is wasting va- valuable resources valuable pair of dollars she just you know she's just just uh sponging off the you know just sponging off you that on. the family's doing it for attention and all these all these really disparaging things that if you if you acknowledge the context are really racist things to even think so talk a little bit about our modern our contemporary concept of what comprises death 
Like what's agreed oh. on by the current medical establishment as, as so, comprising death? The current medical establishment has uh, centered around this this concept called brain death. Right. Uh, yeah. So um, they examine your brain function. And if your brain function is kind of flatlined, you're not, you know, as far as they can tell, you, you're not having, you're not responding to stimuli. Like you're, like they said, their pupils didn't dilate. Uh, they dropped water in her ear. She didn't respond. Mm -hmm. Those kinds of tests, right? That like these reflexes that indicate that your brain on a very low level is able to function and fire. It's right? doing the stuff that it normally does. Right. And then if you're not responding to those tests, they understand you to be what they call brain dead. Even, that if, even if most of your organs, all you know, the rest of your organs, all the rest of your organs are, are functioning. functioning or able to function with support like a ventilator yeah, or and able to function with a feeding tube or something like that. And, um, and I, and I've got to say this understanding of brain death, is directly related to our um, process of organ transplant. To, to the, 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 de the relatively recent development, development of being able to, to take organs, to from, take organs a, right. from a dying person and put them, them into, into a, a, living a living person. person. Um, yeah. And so this, this understanding of death is functionally what allows us to ethically engage in organ transplant. There's a great quote that mentions uh, Peter Singer, philosopher. Yes who's not exactly known for his... Um, pro-life views? Pro-life views. No, you wouldn't describe him that way at all. Not at all. And he's often attacked uh, from the right by conservatives, like saying, yeah. can you believe this guy? But actually, I find him to be quite interesting. You know, I don't always oh, agree. Oh, he's really interesting, yes. But I think he's a real thinker, you know. And, right. and his view on this, he described it, quote, a concept so desirable in its consequences that it is unthinkable to give up, and so shaky on its foundations that it can scarcely be supported. Right. The new death was, quote, an ethical choice masquerading as a medical fact. Yeah. Precisely. And I, I it, think that's exactly true. That's exactly true. Because I do not, I mean, to, to really consider the body as a system, mm -hmm. a human life as a system, I don't, have a strong degree of confidence that it's possible to draw a really bright line right. and say, we know with absolute certainty that on one side of this line, a person is alive, and on the other side, a person is dead. I just don't think the body works that way. It doesn't work that way. And you really can't, you really can't honestly say that as a fact. This was now, a, there, yeah. there's, you know, a lot of cases are obviously clear oh, cut, certainly. right? <laughs> like on an individual basis, right? Yeah. Right, certainly. But, um, yeah, I mean, in your own family, you, you tell the story of your mother who was badly oh, right. injured. She was very badly injured. Uh, my, uh, in 1990, my uh, mother was run over by a car. Yeah. And um, she was brought to the hospital. Uh, it, you know, the ambulance came, took her to the hospital, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, my oldest brother, who was a physician, right. went to find her. Because like, we were, he, he came home from work. He's like, where's mom? Oh, let me tell you. <laughs> and no one was quite sure what hospital he, he, she was at. So he just started going to hospitals. So he went to the first hospital. Um, and this was like before you would just call on your cell phone, right? And uh, when he got there, she was there. Yes. Uh, he happened to have the good fortune to be on staff at that hospital. Uh -huh. And he yeah. found her in the morgue. Yeah. They had tagged her as dead and left her body in the morgue. But he felt and found a pulse. Mm -hmm. And she was steaming up his mirror. She was breathing. She was breathing. She had shallow breathing and a she shallow was, pulse. She was in severe shock and had she, suffered some some horrific injuries. So really horrific. I mean, the car yeah. ran over her twice, actually. <laughs> and um, so he, since he was on staff, was in the morgue, got an orderly and said, let's bring this woman up to the emergency room. She needs immediate care. She's yeah. breathing. She has a pulse. Yeah. And... Um, she lived another 22 years yeah. after that. Yeah, and she wasn't, just to be clear, she didn't just live another 22, 22 years. years. Like, she woke up and was a functional person. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah like, she woke up. She she walked again. She walked again. Now, she yeah. did have long-term injuries. She had long-term injuries, long-term mobility a, a scooter, problems. Uh, right. Yeah. But she wasn't, you know. She wasn't in a persistent vegetative state. No. By a long less, shot. I mean, we had meals that she cooked and conversations that we and had. she spent time with her grandchildren and watched tv you know <laughs> uh, hung out work, you know, yes 
built a garden. Actually, that was yes. before she ever went to Saginaw and built that right. huge garden and all the work she did in Saginaw. Right. So this was two years wasn't, before that. Yeah. So I'm like, there was no like it didn't continue to be. Well, she's near yeah, death. She's you near know. Death. No, it didn't stay in that liminal space. No, at all. But a decision was made that she was dead. That she was actually dead. And she That's was into the morgue. Hard. And and I don't I think this happens more often than people would like to, yeah. to because believe. Let's pretend for a minute that we were a different family. Yeah. And let's pretend that my oldest brother wasn't a physician, or let's just pretend he wasn't on staff at that hospital. Right. Right. Some detail changed. Some detail of this story changed. She probably wouldn't have gotten out of that morgue. No. So at some point that the uh, uh, right. You know, probably within another hour or or even less, less. she wouldn't know, have been her, breathing her or like pulse anymore. Right. The label they gave her would have become true. Right. So, um, yes, and uh, what we had, what we used to have, was this cardiorespiratory failure. That's the only way you die. Your heart's not beating, yeah. and you're not breathing. So, in other words, the two tests that Jim performed. Right. Is she is she fogging the, yeah. the more traditional right? Is she fogging up a mirror? Of what, can I feel a pulse? Right. And he felt a pulse, and she fogged up a mirror. So he um, in, initiated a resuscitation, which right. ultimately worked. And, uh, and yes, it was a very hard row to hoe, but um, yes, the advent of the modern ventilator, this oxygen treatment, coincided with the advent of the ability to perform. Um, uh, organ transplants yes. and they kind of developed in tandem and supported each other where to to uh, give birth to this new understanding of death yeah. as brain function yeah. and maybe they performed those brain function tests for my mom and she wasn't responsive who, I don't actually know I don't know I don't know and who knows I don't know I mean I I suspect that they may have done you know like shouted at her and you know or something or I have no idea yeah um, and and maybe Maybe the like the pulse, you know, became stronger after she, you know, like after a while. After a while, right? right. Maybe she recuperated a little bit. Maybe at the time they were trying to measure a pulse, it was really, really, really weak. weak and she, they couldn't find one or whatever. I, I don't know. But anyway, it's it's quite interesting. We're not. I think you and I are actually a little bit split about the issue of organ donation yes i'm not in favor of organ donation if the person uh, has to be alive to uh to donate the organ so that leaves stuff like uh, i think well I, let, me, let me put it this way i should rephrase that so um i would personally i yeah. would happily donate a kidney to a stranger i yeah. wouldn't think twice right um I, I'd encur- and i personally would encourage any healthy person to do so your your the line you draw is that if you're if you still meet the traditional definition of being alive, you get to keep it. You get to keep it. Yeah. And um, I think you may be winning me over gradually because I'm kind of like, well, you know, if a person's brain dead, but I, I'm a case like this suggests to me that the generally accepted concept of brain death is too vague. It's just too vague. And it may not be very accurate. And we now let's be very clear. We embrace it and we defend it yeah. vigorously because it's the only leg organ transplant has to stand on. I th- think that may be true. Right. But I also believe that if organ transplantation didn't create this definition of death, um, that the for-profit health Healthy. industry likely would would do it, would, yeah, would you know, promote a similar concept. Yeah. So they can Just, stop paying. So they can stop paying for care. So that they yeah, can yeah, so right. they can develop a, a ethical, you know, a, like a, mm-hmm. a, a a definition of uh, life that um, where the the medical ethics behind it fit nicely with their fiduciary <laughs> responsibility to shareholders. Right? Yes. Yes. That's it's it's hard. For, you mentioned that last night, and it's actually hard for me to not to that emerge that yeah. it's always interesting how our ethics really seem to fall in line with like you know the financial interests of people who are wealthy now, kind of like the church used to be against usury yeah yeah flat yeah. up straight out right. no usury it's a sin but this also so now the um, church engages in usury this 
has I think there's a, a connection to the way that um, you've talked about how the church does not embrace the death penalty under Correct. any circumstances, right? However, right. there is a circumstance in traditional church writing and teaching. Oh, oh, I've I've I've, I've tried to be clear about that. Yeah. The church does not uh, in- embrace the death penalty as a right to kill. Yes. The church only understands the death penalty in the context of a right to self-defense. As a right to self-defense. That the, that right. In other words, if you, let's say you can't, you know, take care of this person in your town or village or whatnot who's killing people. Just keeps killing people. Jeffrey Dahmer keeps getting out of his cage. Yeah. And every time You do dies. have an affirmative right to kill this person in self-defense if nothing else is going to protect your life. If nothing else life. is going to protect the life of the community. The life of the com- the lives in the, in the then community. Then the community has that right to self-defense. Right. And that's the only ethical frame under which the church understands the death penalty. Now, people are... Okay, this... Hear me out. <laughs> I'm going to hear you out. Yeah, I'm always ready. So, um, this... Uh, I made a notation here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Naila said that the cost of care was roughly $150,000 a week. Yeah. So people will be making the claim the claim that um, keeping this young woman alive. Mm-hmm. Well, not let's let's just say not removing her her not life removing, support, not removing right, her life support. Yes, is um, too costly, and sure. this expense, this ongoing expense, is harming. The community, it's taking resources away from other patients, uh, From it's taking resources away from whatever. We're mm-hmm. the richest country in the world, but basically we can't afford to keep this black girl alive. It's expensive. Yeah. Or, again, alive. <laughs> Such as it is. Such as it is. But So people will make that argument. Certainly. It's a lot like the arg- I see it as a lot like the argument ab- about welfare queens. And con oh, right. artists, why we have to kick these people off welfare and get them back to work, right? I, that's an argument. It is an argument. It's a legitimate argument, but I think it's a disingenuous legitimate argument because yes. it's too shallow. It's too say, say. So let's go back to our example of the death penalty, right? Where um, you have a right to defend yourself, right? Yes. So is the claim that this $100,000 a week is killing people. Is that the claim? That it's killing the community. Right. And people are dying because of this $100,000. It's similar to the to the argument that well, if we don't kill these 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 uh, inmates, the taxpayers have to pay to to feed them and, Precisely. Ha- and house them. Precisely. You know. Um, incidentally, it's less expensive to do that than it is to right pursue because death. the death penalty litigation and all that is so far outstrips expensive. the cost of keeping them alive. Yes, right. And I would maintain that the process to remove someone's life support, if we had a different understanding of death, right, would far outstrip the cost to the community of keeping them alive. Yeah, in, in a very similar way. That said, all that said, um, it is fundamentally disingenuous to claim that her medical care is killing our sure. national community. Right. That, that the cost of her medical care is actually killing us. No. That's just a lie. Because if, if, that's, if that's actually killing us, then it's actually killing us to allow corporations not to pay any of their damn taxes. Right. If that is actually killing us. Right. It's not. It's like the distraction yes, of saying it, that, it you is, know. It is expensive, and it oh, is an ongoing And I don't thing. deny that it's expensive. I don't deny that it's ongoing. But this is honestly a matter of priorities. It's, so yeah. I, I want to go from there a little bit. I had uh, one sort of outra- go, please, righteous claim I had to make. Please, though. make your outrageous claim. No, not outrageous, righteous. Oh, righteous. My righteous claim is that that's as genuine as the assertion that we've got to balance the budget on the food stamp. Benefit. Oh right, right. It is one half of one percent right. of the budget. Right. Shut up and go home with that. If right. you just don't like poor people, go ahead and make your argument about how much you hate poor people. But don't but be honest. Li- be, be honest, honest about, about, it. about it. Don't lie about how right. this is critical to our financial health. Right. Because if you want to talk about how keeping this girl alive right. is going to bankrupt us, right. if that's honestly your argument, then we need to have a long talk about the Pentagon. Yeah. <laughs> so. So, so the family that. has kept 
kept this girl alive yes. with this medical intervention that's yes. quite costly. And over time, you want me to talk about what state she's in now, or do you want to talk about it? Oh, you, you can go ahead and talk about it, yeah. Because I I feel a little uh, diffident, is that the word? Uh, like yeah, Maybe. So she... Uh, there, there's a few things that have have become clear. Yeah, she responds to spoken commands. Yes, right. She is. There is still an interior. There's some interior life happening. life happening in which this this girl is now capable of responding to commands. Right, and uh, so, for example, my favorite uh, bit is. When her her mother would say, "Show us which finger you would use to tell someone to f off," right? <laughs> and she would very which, slowly, after very a slowly. delay, like move her middle, middle finger, finger right. right? So clearly, something's going on. Right? She can interpret these statements. Right. That's not a yes no. That's a yeah. That, that's a lot. That's a significant feedback loop. And they they have video. They They've video. Done, shot mm-hmm. a lot of video of her responding. Mm-hmm. But it's um. I guess, diff- like a little questionable about what's going on because it's also uh, they've shot a lot of video and they've captured a few moments where she s- seems to respond right. quickly to a to a command or a stimulus in a way that that makes it really cl- makes it clear to an a, outside a, observer. clear to an outside observer that she's responding specifically to this thing right. But when other people try and interact with her, maybe they say something, maybe 20 seconds later, she right. has a movement or something. Right. And so it's not, that's, I guess, different. Like, I'm not fully convinced that she's reliably hearing and understanding and responding to stimuli. So there is, I, I, it's like, I, I'm convinced there is some some functioning going on where she hears something and she responds and she can interpret words. Her mom claims she has conversations where she signals yes and no with her fingers. Right. I'm not entirely sure whether that's really happened or whether the parents have kind of trained her and trained themselves to believe What's happening? Or yeah, it's it's hard to say. It's a little hard to say. You agree that it's a little a little loose, a little vague. Like you can't you can't reliably like say, you know, move this finger, she moves this finger, move that finger, she moves that finger. There's these long delays, and there's these, and it's not easily reproducible. Right. And that like most of the day. Mm-hmm. She's not responsive, but you make her in a window where she'll where she's be responsive. responsive for a while, like she's more awake. Right, and actually, one of the uh, professionals, medical professionals, they spoke with, yeah, r- spoke about that. Yeah, that you know, it's not actually surprising that she might be uh, semi-conscious or unconscious, unconscious most of the day. most of the time, most of the day, like you know, twenty hours out of twenty-four, and there's a window occasionally that you may or may not be able to to enter, catch to catch when she's conscious enough to engage with you yeah that's not uh hard to believe or imagine so but something that seemed also very promising and not mm-hmm. so ambiguous was mm-hmm. that they had a uh calixto machado the president of the cuban society of clinical neurophysiology yeah and this person came out and did some scans and discovered that, you know, normally for someone who's been actually only alive because of a ventilator, ventilator? for this long, you would have, have expected and, and had undergone true brain death. Yeah. What, what, they're, what they're specifically referring to as brain death. You would have expected to see that the brain had largely liquefied, literally had just there were no blood flow to the brain all those cells died it's just kind of a sludge in there sometimes they even calcify right right and what that what this this uh machado dr machado said is that um the the recent scans say that um show that that there is uh still 
Right, the nerve fibers that connect the brain's right and left hemispheres were barely recognizable. But large areas of her cere cerebrum, which mediates consciousness, language, and voluntary movements, were structurally intact. And uh, so Dolan shouted, she's, she's got, got a, brain. a brain. She has a brain. Right. Now, McConnell, but there is still like a, a lot of damage to the brain stem. Yes, which is the part that would actually allow, allow, her, allow her voluntary control over her body. Right. Or, or like full, full voluntary. Like, full voluntary. Control. And like allow her to breathe on her own. Right. Right. And Machado also noted, did various tests like uh, noted that, the, that her uh, parasympathetic responses, like her heart rate, change mm -hmm. when her mother speaks to her right and said uh, you know when her mother says i love you everyone is proud of you her heart rate changes and machado notice notes that uh, this is not found this responsiveness is not found in a patient brain that's truly brain, really brain, dead. brain dead right so they're meanwhile they're trying to get uh california um to overturn the death certificate because yeah Be <laughs> It seems, it seems absurd that they would find her brain dead under these circumstances now. So yeah, it does seem absurd, but they don't. They didn't apparently think there was enough evidence. Well, the time the time has elapsed. It's too. It's been. She's been dead too long. Like, well, yeah. You let her leave her dead even longer. Maybe she'll be even less dead. Right. <laughs> okay. So we can just keep going. I guess. Right. So it's it's really puzzling though because you do have to ask yourself. Um, what are her prospects for any kind of anything? What what for anything? Like what 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 is going to be achieved the longer she stays in this condition, in this situation? And what the article is suggesting is that some degree of recovery may be possible. Maybe, but will she ever be able to speak? Clearly? It's a very long shot. It's a long shot. It really is a long shot. Will she? Will she ever be able to a speak? Long, slow shot. I mean, probably she'd never be able to walk. That, let's let's rule out a lot of you know. Yeah, maybe you know. But um, and they're also. I, I was encouraged to read that her family is trying to get her to pr provide some feedback on what what she wants. What she wants. How she feels about what's going on and what we're doing. Yeah. Whether she feels. Like her experience in in this almost locked in condition mm -hmm. is something she wants to continue, or if she's uh, you know unhappy, unhappy like this, right? Well, um, did you you did you get to the part about the the one young man that was um, in a similar state where you could credibly describe him as brain dead after the incident, and he was four. He lived another twenty years because he was. Able to stay on a ventilator. He lived 20 years. Was this the guy whose brain actually was calcified? Yeah, yeah. He, he, and this is with, with um, appar apparently the diagnosis was correct. His brain actually did start to deteriorate even further. Um, he, he lived another 20 years on a ventilator. The outside of his brain had calcified. His heart beat for 24 more years, during which time he grew proportionally and recovered from minor wounds and infections. Yeah. Um. <sighs> So it's hard to say what the prospects are. I I don't care to comment on the utility or value In a, of, of a life. Of a life. Or to or to suggest that Yeah, we were we were having this conversation last night. What's the utilitarian what's the, argument? And I I don't care to make we're any not, we're not Pete Singer. Yeah, I, I don't care to make any utilitarian argument. I'm not yeah, gonna make any comment. Yeah in that respect because I know that the value I get from my children in my life is irreplaceable and cannot be counted. So this guy, this guy Schumann. So, you know, it's not, that's not someplace I'm really ready to go. Yeah. So I, yeah, Schumann, I, what about I agree. Schumann? Oh, this guy Schumann, he said he was um, one of the people responsible for the modern concept of brain death. Yes. Right. He has now, he said that he has dissented, dissented from his ideas about brain death. And it's the reason that he has is in part because he's seen so many cases where, where people, people survive. Right. They actually know, weren't dead the way we described them dead. In a sense. So, um, and he, he said his quote, his, he has disavowed his earlier views. He published a paper called 
recovery from, quote, brain death, unquote, a neurologist apologia. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he said that um, dissenters from the brain death concept are typically dismissed condescendingly as simpletons, religious zealots, or pro-life fanatics, and announced that he's joining their their ranks. ranks. That's me too. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It it hinges on what he calls chronic survival. They keep surviving. Chronic survival. I thought that was just a, a beautifully ironic, ridiculous term. Right. They just keep going. Yeah. Somehow, some way, keep going. Meanwhile, and, they're trying to find file their taxes. And they can't because apparently the, she's dead and they can't claim her. The IRS is saying they can't claim her as a dependent. And she's like, I don't want to fight the IRS. No, God. <laughs> God no. Um, um, yeah. They they're, uh, filed a malpractice lawsuit against the Children's Hospital seeking damages for pain and suffering. Yeah, there's no pain and suffering for a corpse. The Sorry. the hospital argued that deceased bodies do not have legal standing to Just sue. sue. Just saying. They're saying plaintiffs are preserving Jahi's body. Again, basically saying this is a corpse. She's dead. She's dead. Uh, and there's no doubt. Uh, from its natural post-mortem course, it would be against public policy to hold death, to hold health professionals liable for the cost of futile medical interventions performed on a dead person. And they even made this, I thought, really enraging argument that um, asking anyone to asking any medical professional nursing staff or whatnot to to work on her care Mm -hmm. would be traumatic emotionally traumatic 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 for these people and unfair to subject them to this kind of trauma Mm. so Mm -hmm. caring for a dead person is too ghoulish it's all (sighs) so I'm not prepared to tell any parent um that if they want to, if they want to receive care for their child, I'm on their team. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm really not prepared to say, well, she's not responsive. Well, she's not this. Well, she's not that. Well, she's got this problem. I don't think it's worth pursuing. And I'm not. I'm not ethically willing to follow the utilitarian argument no. to its logical conclusion. No. Because you know what? Someone could make the case that I'm 50 years old and I just don't have that much... That much use left. Use left in you me. Really, what do you got to give society? I, I don't feel that I have that much use left in me, right? right. So, um, you know, what's, what's to keep me from just uh, having my life declared completed? And just and shuffling off, you the know? The state decides that they'll... They're going to pay for my euthanasia, but not any health care. Any health care. Because, you know, we can't really make any use of you anymore. Right. So I'm not I'm not comfortable with that utilitarian argument. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I, I am not. And it's largely this, this idea that you can quantify somebody's experience of love for a family member. For a family member. No, I don't, I don't think you can. But you can, that there's some kind of something you can put on that. Um. I, it's it's just I don't think it's even possible to count that. No. Right, and there's something going on that the author of this article mentions. Okay, so maybe the family's got this joint delusion. Folly a uh, famille. Right. Uh, it's it's like folly a do, except folly shared do. by a whole family. A whole family, and they're all imagining that she's responding and engaging, and they're all imagining that she's a- alive. And the family's engaged in this joint delusion together, except I don't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't call it a delusion, but I. I do think they are probably feeding and supporting each other's optimistic bias. I would. Gr- I would grant that a hundred percent. Yeah, that they are feeding each other optimistic bias, right, right. which is actually a healthy thing that families it's what do. What families do for each other, right? It's yeah. a healthy, and actually, it's a healthy thing that you do for each other in times of crisis. Yeah, there's no way you can yeah. survive this. But you know what? We got each other. We're doing okay. It's right. fine. It's fine. Keep but going, it, everybody. Keep walking. But even with all this support, like it mentions that the the mother is suffering from severe depression, depression and anxiety, anxiety at all this kinds point, of issues. You right. Know, um, I so can't imagine. Imagine not. this. Not <laughs> right. How, how you could survive and not have those these effects on your health. Right. But um, if the if the family is experiencing this delusion, yeah. every nurse that cares for her is experiencing this delusion. Every medical professional not affiliated with the hospital or the state of California is also experiencing this delusion. What do you think? Do you remember the who was the child that was horribly bludgeoned? 
killed in Mississippi in the 70s. Oh. Wow. And the, the parents insisted on having an open casket funeral to show the world. Oh, Emmett Till. That Emmett, was the 60s. That, that was like okay, the I'm 50s. Sorry. Yeah, Emmett, Emmett Till. Till. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, I couldn't. Uh, that's who I was thinking of. But I could, mm-hmm. I'm sorry that I couldn't come up with a name. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think there's a, an aspect of this in which the parents are basically saying, uh, and I support them in this, mm-hmm. this is our open casket funeral. You motherfuckers are going to have to look at what you've done. And oh, you oh. don't get to just bury it. Oh, I, I think there's, I don't think that's a conscious element, but I think that's there. Yeah, I do too. Right. But I, I think like it's between the lines here in the in the article. Yeah, that, and they just barely skim it when they talk about it. Well, at the of hospital. course, the New Yorker is Can't. targeted at white liberals Liberal. who couldn't possibly be racist, and a lot of their friends and family are medical professionals, professionals. who couldn't possibly, possibly be, be racist, racist. right? Um, or bigoted in any way. Yeah. Um, but no, there's really this like no, we're not doing organs. What happened? Yes. And this whole no one's right. No one's taken responsibility, and that was Yet. that was the Five exact yeah. experience. Actually, my rage and your rage too. I think when when Covenant. Oh, uh, that was that was St. Mary's. I'm sorry, St. Mary's Hospital, in Saginaw, Michigan. Nearly killed you. Yes, like by with neglect. Right. Failed to notice that your blood pressure had dropped to nothing, mm-hmm. and that you were, you know. You couldn't speak. You were you were un- unconscious. You you were about you. I was so, really close. So this girl died. Uh, well, okay. <laughs> Achieved brain death. Uh, <laughs> well, except that that um, there, one of the the people interviewed in the article says now I think we should think of brain death as a as a severe trauma that happens to the brain, yeah. not as a state that it enters and stays. Right, yeah, necessarily. Like right. You, yeah. So, but this girl, her brain injury, mm-hmm. I believe, came probably came about because of severe blood loss. Correct. And That's, that seems consistent. And with then that know. also triggered her heart to stop. You know, because if yeah. your heart doesn't have any blood to pump, at some point it can't. It can't. Right. And her blood oxygenation level went way down. Way down. Well, you were bleeding internally. Yes. Your blood pressure dropped to what was it? Some. It was 50 over 30 or something like that. Yeah, it was like, I think it was 40. Your heart almost, had it gone on much longer, your heart would have given up. Right. And actually, I I was conscious. I I was conscious. I did not lose consciousness. You didn't. I tried to go to the bathroom and I was feeling really weird. You couldn't walk. I couldn't walk. And I just had this sort of weird sensation, like not quite vertigo, but just, I knew I wasn't well. I couldn't figure out how. And I thought I needed to go to the bathroom. The blood flow to your brain was dropping like dropping. a stone. And um, when I tried to get up, I, I since I felt so weird, I asked uh, an orderly to help me. Yeah. And I just collapsed. And he got me back into bed. And he looked at me and called. A, a, he did not call a code, but he called like an emergency team. Yeah. That I can't remember. The, like there's, a, there's some kind of name they have for this yeah. team. And it's like a physician, a nurse, um, a couple of other, like anything like a nurse practitioner. And they come and do an evaluation and any kind of emergency intervention. It's basically like a, a small emergency room team. Yeah. Um, and he had the presence of mind to notice that you definitely weren't this looking how, well. She's not looking well. And and that we need the emergency team. Yeah. And they, they did not, um, they pumped up your blood pressure using saline. Yeah, there's that saline to... To move my blood pressure to get up. your blood pressure going in the right direction because you were crashing because I was crashing and I do recall that this team came in and they were kind of like so what do you think's happening why do you think it's happening and they were kind of going back and forth a little bit and at that moment the oldest person on the team who was a, a nurse yeah said gentlemen this woman's going to die in ten minutes yeah we have to get her blood pressure back up yeah and so they did. <sighs> But they can bicker about it later. We can bicker about what's happening later. Yeah. But right now, she, need, she needs your blood pressure back up to survive. So let's take care of that. That This whole thing got to this point because they were not watching you adequately. No, no. And um, not... And various complaints and so on. We're like, is that okay? Is that normal? Not well, doing th- anything about the fact that you were clearly bleeding internally. Right. And then, and kept saying, oh, I don't think there's any problem. I don't think like you're bleeding internally. When I asked it, so that team came... 
I was in bad shape. What's going on here? I'm like, oh, I don't think anything's going on. I don't think there's yeah. a problem. By the way, would you sign this form? Because we got to give you like four units of blood. Yeah. I'm like, what do right. I need for it? And actually, at that point, I said, I'm not signing the form. What do I need four units of blood for? Well, you're bleeding internally. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but they would actually not admit to me that I was no, bleeding internally. This is like, the, oh, there's nothing wrong. We just need to give you some blood products. <laughs> and then this was exactly the thing. The best I could do to get someone to admit that this didn't go as planned was when I got one older doctor to say, no, you're right. It's not supposed to go like this. It's, not <laughs> it's not really like not this. supposed to go like this. This is not a normal. This is yeah. not a normal thing. But no one would admit this is, and this is a medical liability. professional stonewall. And that's what they do. It's what they're trained to do. For liability reasons. For liability reasons. They right. won't admit anything. They, they um, absolutely don't have to. Right. And, They'll hide, they'll lose your records, which they did. They oh, hid yeah. your records. records. I right. couldn't, I, there was a record mm. of your blood pressure drop. Right. There was a record of these interventions. They disappeared, they disappeared. from your records by the time I was trying to get copies, copies. To in order it. to take to an attorney. <laughs> Imagine that. So, and that, if you look at their story, that, yes. and they say themselves, would this have turned out this way? If they had, Treated us with any compassion or dignity? Compassion and respect. I mean, they talk about how know. a couple nurses seemed concerned that this girl was spitting up a lot, an awful lot of blood, right? Like, well, don't change her blood, her, her gown. Like, what, what? So you can observe the blood loss? Okay. Yeah. Well, that actually, that actually made sense to me. It made some sense, yeah. see you how much see. she was bleeding. But but she was neglected. She, yeah. you know, well, I, I, in, observation in is not the same opinion, as action. Right. <laughs> in my at. opinion, she was neglected. <laughs> And in my opinion, she was neglected probably because white medical staff do not see black people among them as fully human. Yeah. Full stop. Yeah. And I think that's, this is a case, a, a textbook case of that. Yeah. And so what does this mean? And for me, all these end of life decisions, people have various utilitarian conversations. Yeah. And they have various, um, like science and rationalist conversations. And they have um, all manner and kind of ideas about the idea, right? Yeah. They have all kinds right. of thoughts about the idea. Right. But the fact, and the only bottom line that I'm interested in, right. is how this frame affects the marginalized. Yes. And yeah. if it's going to harm the marginalized, you're wrong. It's wrong. You're just wrong. You're using the wrong, the wrong intellectual framework. The whatever wrong it is you're doing, whatever your ideas. scaffolding is, whatever your idea is, yeah, it's wrong. If the net and outcome, we, we start with the marginalized. That's where you start. Rather than well, it works really for well for wealthy me. white liberals or like or you know, for me, right? Yeah, for me, of, yeah, right. And and the, the, there's comment about how you know our definition of. Of brain death was very appealing to intellectuals, mm -hmm. right? Who, who value live in, their who their brain, live in their brains, who value mental intellectual work above working. everything else, right? But other cultures, other societies, other faiths, other might think of life and death as more of a physical. Like, what's your body doing? What's your body doing? Not are you going to be able to write an essay again? You're oh, going to get you can right. write you another piece again? for JAMA. Can you get published? I'm just asking. Yeah. Well, you're not. Well, what's that joke? So are they? Uh, is he viable yet? I don't know. He hasn't graduated medical school. Right, right. So, that's you know, how you know. When that's the, when the child's viable. When the child's finally viable. <laughs> right. So that's not the frame that everyone's operating with. Yeah. And and I don't think right. it should be. Right. I, um, I think th that a diversity of frames and a diversity of views. You know, if your definition of of life and death mm -hmm. can't accommodate a diversity of human views, views and it's not big enough. It's not big enough. Yeah. And I think this is. I think this is. This is what I'd like to. The my my last note. You'd like to end on. Yeah. Um. I think clearly, every person that's not affiliated with the hospital that's engaged. Well, largely, every person that's engaged with Jahi on a day to day basis now yeah. is experiencing her as alive. As alive to some extent. To, to some extent. Yeah. They have an experience of her as clearly alive. Clearly not dead. Yeah, she's clearly not dead. As yeah. one person said, um, I forget which one, it, was it Schumann? Said she's profoundly disabled, but right. alive. That was an interesting phrasing, too. Yeah, no, in the best case, you know, she's profoundly disabled. But she's alive. But. Um, 
We and don't. We don't kill our helpless disabled the people. people. We just don't do that. Yeah. And um, and I think certainly the people with a vested interest in her not being alive aren't having that experience. Yes. Right. And there were cer- and there were certainly people like someone called it an anonymous tip to the officers that uh, oh yeah they actually actually sent police based. officers into her house because they because they body. told they told the officers they're they're harboring a, a, a dead body, body there. the and officers you know, came in and like saw this girl on a ventilator, ventilator. and they're like i, I don't see, see a dead, dead body. body and so but no this is this is how nasty human beings are to each other over ideas like this over ideas like this yeah it's like being swatted. Yeah, it's it's really kind of perverse. But I think people who are engaged with her day to day, yeah, are experiencing her as alive. Right. And I, that's probably enough. That's probably enough. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that, I think that's that's where we're at. All right. You have any nasty comments? Bring it. Bring it. We'd love to hear them. Yeah. No, read the article. Oh, the read nice the ar- ones, too. Read yeah, the article. Nice uh, read the yeah. article. I mean, we didn't write any of this. We're just, just talking, talking about, about it. it. And yeah, we'd love to hear what you have to say. And you I, can disagree or not. I, yeah. It's cool with me. And I'm, like I said, I, I'm I'm trying to not to be dogmatic because just about everything I thought I believed about organ donation and brain death and all that, I'm a little skeptical of these days. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's. Um, all right. I'm still planning to donate my organs. Do but, what you got to um, do. But, uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, everybody. <laughs> Have a good week. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Take care.